Uh, since Ivo is here to open two shows in Manchester, I thought we'd start by talking about those two, and the Fountainhead specifically, which opens tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know it, uh, it is a 727-page novel uh, by Ayn Rand, uh, a very famous novel, which is about an uncompromising genius architect, Howard Rourke, and his struggles uh, in his profession. And the obvious question, Evo, is why this particular book? What was it about the book that you said, I've, I've got to dramatize this? There's a little story to this, which, which I can tell very in quickly. Uh, I, in 2007, when I did Roman Tragedies, uh, that was a combination of uh, uh, and, uh, uh, Julius Caesar, Anthony and Cleopatra, and Coriolanus in one go, uh, I had an assistant who gave me on opening night in Amsterdam this novel, uh, uh, Ian Rand, uh, The Fountainhead, in a very ugly, small pocket, you know, and it's 700 pages, yes. 50 pages. If you have to read it in a book like that, it's not very attracting. Uh, but he wrote on the first page, Ivo, this, you have to read this now, in capitals, you know. And he was a really good friend of mine, I respected him a lot. And so I thought, well, I should give it a go, you know, during my holiday. And then after 10 pages, probably I will end and stop and I will say thank you, but, you know, it's okay. But I started to read, and I find myself, you know, the first time that I stopped reading, page 150, all right, uh, already. So it became like a page turner for me. I couldn't stop. I couldn't wait to go on reading it. Mm -hmm. I didn't know Ian Rand at all, <laughs> must admit, not at all. Let be the political circumstances, you know, of her, which I, of course, discovered later on. So, but I was immediately attracted, and uh, because of one of the things, because, I, uh, it, was because it describes a, a kind of uh, uh, um, culture of architects, which you don't find in the theater, you know? It's not so, ma so many plays about architects. Uh, Ibsen wrote one, but it's yeah. the fact that he is an architect is not really very, very, very important or elaborate in that play. So, and that's, so that attracted me a lot to do something <laughs> about this m milieu uh, this, uh, of, of, of architects. But much deeper than that, all these characters are like, uh, yeah, bigger than life. Uh, it, made me rem it reminded me a little bit of Eugene O'Neill <laughs> somehow. And I'm a fan of Eugene O'Neill. I did a lot of Eugene O'Neill. Uh, which is also, we, he, he describes very specific people, but he, at the same time they represent something much more than, them, than themselves. Uh, I immediately wanted to do it on stage. I immediately started to make notes in the novel, you know, when uh -huh. I was reading it. And then I applied for the rights, but I couldn't get them. Uh, I discovered later on that Brad Pitt had <laughs> them, you know. <laughs> Uh, uh, because Ange Angelina Jolie, she did, uh, uh, not this, but Atlas Shrugged, she made, they made a television movie, it, it was a, a disaster, and I think they just blocked all the rights in uh -huh. case that, you know, that happens a lot in America. Then it, but I asked my dramaturg, you know, apply for the rights and keep going. But I had forgotten about it, but suddenly, you know, in 2012, five years later, she, because it was a she, the dramaturg at that time, came in my office and said, I have it. I said, what do you mean? You have it? What? <laughs> he said, the fountainhead. And then I said, oh, ah. you know, like, I was so happy. I immediately started working on it. And then we, you know, that's the little story to it. And that's uh, also why I wanted to do this. Yeah. It's a larger than life story about Howard Rourke. Uh, it's two architects, actually. It's not only Howard Rourke. It's, it's Howard Peter. Rourke and Peter Keating. Yeah. And they are good friends in school. And then they get out of school, and Howard Rock really develops into this very uh, driven, ambitious architect who doesn't want to listen to his clients, who just wants to, want, wants to build the building he wants to build. And the clients should accept this. And Peter Keating joins one of the biggest firms in New York, because it's situated in New York, uh, biggest firms in New York, and it's a firm where you can have every uh, style you want. There is somebody for, for every style. You want a modernist thing, we, get, we make you a modernist thing. You, uh, you want something in the uh, uh, style of Doric uh, style, Greek old uh, style or something, we do that. Uh, Howard Rock resents this, you know. So that's what the, what the story is about. It's about an idealist, you could say, uh, uh, against somebody who is a little bit more, not a little bit, who is more pragmatic. 
You mentioned uh, the political circumstances about Avain Rand, which you said you didn't know about when you re read the book, but I mean, they are interesting. Um, she was an advocate of what she ca called rational selfishness. Uh, she believed passionately in laissez-faire capitalism, loathed communism, and is now very much a sort of heroine, isn't she, of the American right-wingers. Does that, did that in any way uh, worry you or disturb you when you found out about her history? Well, it worried and disturbed a lot of people around me, you know, when they heard I was going to do that. All my best friends came to me, Ivo, uh, perhaps this time don't do this. That's for me very hard because once I have my mind set on something, you know, I know why I want to do it and, and you know, that I'm very hard then to, uh, to say no to it or let it go. Uh, in this case, of course, I, I discovered this pretty quickly that also the Tea Party, right? we don't talk about the Tea Party anymore now, but it's like the, even the right wing Republicans, mm -hmm. you know, at that time, their Bible was the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. It was the Bibles of the Tea Party. Everybody says it's also the only book that Trump has read, <laughs> you know, in his life. Do you believe uh, that? He can't have no. read 730 <laughs> no, pages. I don't know. <laughs> but, but, no, but you have to know that it's much more than that. I live also partly in New York and I have a lot of friends there and, and I'm deep into the theater community also rooted there. And there, this, the novels of Ayn Rand really, it's, it, of course, she represents extreme liberalism, extreme liberalism. Uh, but she also represents something all young people have read it in America. You know, you still, when you go in, into whatever bookshop, you will find it, you know, in the first section. You know, mm -hmm. there will be the Fountainhead or Atlas Shrugged or both of them. It's still, it is an inspiration also for younger people on another level, you know, that you can that you can be decisive in your own life, because that's what Howard Dork does. There is a beautiful moment in the, in the novel where he, uh, so he only wants to build what he wants to build and he does, doesn't get a job anymore, you know, because, you know, he's not famous at that moment, he's not, so he doesn't get a job anymore. So his decision is not to give in and not to join uh, the firm where Peter Keating worked, because he could easily do that, because he is a genius in his work, Howard Dork. Uh, no, he decides to go to work in a quarry, you know, and he just doesn't mind, and he is happy with doing that. So that's what inspires, I think, a lot of younger people, a apart from the extreme liberalism, also on uh, goals in your life, you know, that you, and you can achieve. Sometimes it takes some time, and sometimes you get it immediately, but sometimes you have to do something else in order to get back to it. So it's also inspirational, and for me personally, I will jump ahead to the question that will yeah. come. Yes, <laughs> you know <laughs> probably. Coming. You know that for me, because I got then the question in this kind of talks a lot, like Evo, why did you want to put this uh, right-wing book on stage, which I don't consider as a right-wing book. There is right-wing ideas in it. I will come to that, and then I, my answer is very simple. As an artist, I really want to be Howard Rock. Yeah. I really want to be him. Uh, as a citizen, there is a section in our production which a lot of people want me to cut, which I said, no, this has to be in it, uh, where he becomes political. It's in the second part of the show, and then he says, well, I will, I'm very bad at quoting uh, the exact text, but he says uh, something like, uh, if people cannot take care of themselves, uh, I'm not going to take care of them. I'm not going to pay health insurance because other people need it, you know. You have to take care of yourself. If you cannot do that, well, it's uh, a pity you. Of course, as a citizen, I totally resent this. I'm very happy to pay taxes. I'm very ha happy, happy to pay health uh, uh, insurance, you know, so that also people that didn't have the luck that I had up to now in, to, in my life, that I ca I, I'm, I'm happy to share a part of that with other people, with the community. Of course, the novel is anti-community, you know, it's everybody, uh, uh, what, they, what they call now in America, socialist, but I mean communist, you know, <laughs> that's what a socialist is. For us, a socialist, also here in your country, a socialist is something else, eh? it's something that has a social program, you know, that has things about the community and not only about the individual. And that's what, what I find very interesting in the theatre, to put these sh things who are very sharply defined in this novel next to each other, and it's up to you to make a choice. You mentioned a moment ago what you call the very beautiful scene when he goes to work in the quarry because he can't get work and therefore he becomes a manual labourer, doesn't he? Yeah. But that leads, as you well know, to a notorious scene, which I gather is in your version, uh, yeah, for sure. when he 
not to, put, to find a point, he rapes uh, Dominique, the woman he loves. Can I just quote a line from the novel? I mean, yes, of course, fiction drama has often dealt with this subject, but in the, in the novel, Dominique, having been raped, says, it was the act of a master taking shameful, contemptuous possession of her was the kind of rapture she had wanted. It's a very un... what's the word? Uh, rather unappealing view, isn't it? This man has forced himself on her, but then, according to Ayn Rand, it's what she really wanted after all. Is that how you approach it or how you stage it? Yeah, of course, because it's written, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, it's one of the mysteries in, in, in the novel. It's this relationship between Dominique, is her name, and between Howard Rock. And we shouldn't go too deep into it because it's also something to discover. Because, but in the beginning of the, of, the, of the novel, she is like a very pessimistic person. You know, not believing in the world. Uh, she's a journalist. Eh? Uh, uh, that doesn't mean. <laughs> no, 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 just misunderstand me. No, 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 no. I, did, I didn't want to say that. But uh, she is a journalist, and she writes, and she has a very pessimistic view on people, on society, and doesn't believe in any future anymore. And then she meets in the quarry Howard Rourke, and there is an immediately a, a thing that happens, which is called falling in falling in love. Eh? It's like. When you see somebody on the street, is, and it happens to you, it's, a, it's like a Romeo and Juliet moment, you know? It's like, it gets you, you don't know why. It's uh, beyond rationality. And that's that moment, mm -hmm. the, that moment that they see each other, and I think in my production, hopefully that's a very clear moment, that there is a, a, a be, before the, what you, what, what's called the rape eh? uh, scene, that there is something which happens between these two people which, you, which there's no word said at that moment. It's just between the two of them. Are you saying, so it's, you're, are you saying it's not a rape then, really? Do you think it well, is a rape or not? Uh, 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 I cannot say it better than Anne Rand says it herself, because that's what she intended it to be. Mm -hmm. Something that, that uh, Dominique totally, it's consensual. Ah. Yes, I think that's, an, uh, that's arguable, I think, isn't it? Or we, we could debate well, not, that. Not in the, in the view of Anne Rand. Yes, but in, in terms of the narrative, uh, she's in her house, isn't she? And then he, he comes uninvited yeah. to the house. Mm. And he does force himself on her, doesn't he, in, in the story? Yeah. Have you seen this movie by Paul Verhoeven? I don't know if it was released here, Elle, with Isabelle Huppert. Has anyone it's seen this It's a situation, yes. yeah, it's a very beautiful movie, actually. It's not the issue, but it is also Dutch. But uh, uh, and Isabelle Huppert is in it, and uh, it's a French movie, it got Oscar. Oscar nomination, I believe, mm -hmm. a few years ago. It's an almost the same situation. Isabelle, the first thing in the movie is that you see Isabelle Pierre raped. Later on, you discover the real story behind it. Right. It's a little bit, it's complicated. You cannot reduce it to one thing or the other because, but now I have to tell the whole story and it will take a long time, but I can jump ahead, you know, like she starts as this pessimistic person. She, she, she sees somebody and she recognizes something something in him what she is not, and what she wants to be. Somebody who is extreme, somebody who has an ambition, somebody who, has, who is not giving in to things. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, he wants her to discover what extreme liberty is, so and, and autonomy. Because also between them, it's not only that, he's, that he, when he is not getting a job, that he is complaining, no, he starts to work in a quarry, when the relationship doesn't work out totally, because she cannot, uh, uh, really be like he is, because she's afraid of it, uh, then he separates from her. And he, he goes live in a very small town, very far away. And she comes to visit him at a certain moment, a really beautiful scene. That's the real love scene in the mm -hmm. production. Where they really come very close to each other, not in a physical way, but in, in another way. So it's, it's a kind of typical, uh, this is the most typical and in rent, complexity, ambivalence, what you can get. And that's important, I think, because Ian Rand, you know, it's, it's, you should look at YouTube, on YouTube and, and had some interviews with her. When she has an interview, she, she never has one second of a doubt. She always knows <laughs> exactly what she wants to say, you know, but the, her mind is really complex, I think. It's not so easy. You cannot only say it's extreme right-wing, because at the same time, it's inspiring for young people. It's, it's like a very complex world. And if you accept that, and if you don't try to reduce it to one thing, 
you know, then you enter a, a very interesting and a very rich world of thinking and of emotions, I think. Well, tonight and the rest of the week, we shall be able to see this production on stage, and I'm looking forward to it enormously. Can, can I move on to your other Manchester venture, which is Recreating Europe, uh, which, as far as I know, is an assembly of various texts from r past writers about Europe. I mean, is the idea behind it to have a sort of hymn to Europe? Uh, is it no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> I'm not in rent, I'm not proving anything. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is a celebration of Europe. No, no. no. It, it, it starts, it, it was around the, the time of Brexit, and, but also not connected to Brexit, but a time where also in our country, uh, uh, I, I'm Belgian, but I live in Amsterdam for a long time, you know, that Europe became more and more of an issue, uh, an issue to think about. So I thought, you know, and, and that the voices for being against Europe, also within Europe, you know, were, were getting stronger and stronger. I, th I, th I thought, what was the original idea, you know, about Europe? Mm -hmm. So I went to research that together with some people mm -hmm. and helped by the Bali. The Bali is a, a, a center for debate on a very high level in Amsterdam. Uh, and I, I, I said, well, can you help me? Can you help me s do this search? And uh, so we started to, to, uh, to find out what the original thinkers, what their intention was. But also, for instance, there is a speech of Margaret Thatcher in the, uh, in the, in the production, you know, because she was original also against it. You know? So it's nothing new at eh, the Brexit. You know, it's like, or also Britain was in, in the time of Thatcher, and she was prime minister at that yeah. moment, against it. Yeah. And she, but the speech is wonderful. You know? I, I really admire her speech because it's really, she formulates it wonderfully exactly and hard and clear you know so that's what i try to do uh, uh, you know as my theater tries to be wants to be ambivalent and not saying you have to think this or that make up your own mind this evening or this hour it's an hour and five minutes and we have a speaker before it you know who gives his or her in this kind of his opinion about europe uh, it's 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 a moment to, to just think about it to open your our minds you know and i've i've, I've made it uh, in a classic form, three acts, small acts, you know. It starts with a vision, then with a crisis, and then with a the future, you know, and that's what it is. Right. So it's, it gives different opinions, but it's not only speeches by politicians. I mix it with uh, texts who are loosely linked, you know, but from uh, theater plays. Uh, of course, Shakespeare has to be in it. Uh, 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 but there is also Mary Stewart, uh, a, a speech by uh, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, so I mix it. I mix it so uh, arts and politics become one. You cannot divide. You cannot divide right. them anymore. So it's a more an inspirational thing, and to make you think, and to make you consider or reconsider. It's not to say Europe is what we have to do. No, you, you're very clear. You're not using it to express a point of view or issue a polemic. But at the same time, you said you, it touches on the future of Europe. As someone, a profound European like yourself, um, are you optimistic about the future? No, I'm not European. I'm a world citizen. Oh. I, oh. And Europe is part of that, of course. Yes. So I'm also European. As I'm also uh, living in Holland, but also I am a Belgian and I am Flemish. But I don't, every time when I write in a new, it was very interesting, last week we played another production, A Little Life, by, uh, which I did an adaptation of Hania Yangihara's Little Life, and we did it in Barcelona, Catalonia, you know, and we, the, the Flemish uh, right-wing parties have extreme, uh, so they always introduce me in the newspaper, there is the Flemish director, Ivo van Ove. <laughs> I always correct it into the Belgian <laughs> director, Ivo <Eva laughs> van Ove, you know, because I don't accept to be reduced to something. And I'm Flemish, I don't, I'm not ignoring, and I'm totally acknowledging that I'm Flemish, but I'm also Belgian, I'm European, and I'm a world citizen. But uh, the future, I, my question was whether you are confident about Europe and its future identity at a time when, as we all know, I mean, Hungary is going through an extraordinary period, isn't it? Italy is now going through an extraordinary period. Um, Britain, in Spain, in Spain, in Madrid now, for the first time since uh, the big crisis in the 20th century yes. with Franco, they voted ex again extreme right. It's the first time. And Britain, as we know, is going through its own uh, manufactured or self-induced crisis. I mean. Is it, is it possible to be a confident? Yeah, confidence? that's more faulty towers a little bit. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
I enjoyed it because I was here doing all about Eve and I watched all the debates, you know, the, and the, yes. the, so that certainly will be part of the show a little bit, huh? Yes. <laughs> Would I come back to this point about whether Europe, uh, Europe will exist geographically, whether politically and socially it can, it can well, continue to be what I, it is? I'm not a politician and not a sociologist or historian, so I really don't know. I kn what I know is that what you describe is right. There is, we are at a moment in history where there is, and it's also inspired more and more by what happens in America, mm -hmm. because when it can happen in America, of course, it's a huge influence in a lot of places in the world. Um, uh, and the time that we, that we, well, now I give my opinion already, that we think you know, we can go back to the golden age, whatever it was. Which is, of course, not possible. You never can go back, you know, because at the same time, we want our cell phone and we want our iPad. That was n they were not there in the golden age, you know. And that's a little bit what's the contradiction at this moment. And we, we are in the moment that, of course, nationalism, uh, an extreme nationalism in some way, like Hungary is like an extreme nationalist mm -hmm. uh, 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 became, also Poland, uh, yep. the Eastern Europe actually, you know, and we, we will have, we cannot say that's uh, extreme right wing so we don't deal with it. I come from a country uh, where we, we had an extreme right wing party and when I was uh, living in Antwerp uh, uh, in my younger years, uh, we were the first ones in Europe. We had an extreme right-wing party that also got a lot of votes in Antwerp. It was 30%, which is a lot at that moment, you know. So one out of three. I lived in that city, and I know very well what it is to live in a city in that environment. And I know also the dangers of it. So what did, what did we do in Belgium, which I'm not sure if it, it was a good idea. We, and it's a French word. We built a cordon sanitaire. It, I don't know how to translate it in English. It's like uh, they were excluded, even when they won for 30%, they were excluded from every government, also city governments. Mm -hmm. That's not the case anymore, but now they won a lot. After many years, they won a lot in the last elections, which is a sign of the times, what you're describing. So we will, and now the, for the first time in Belgium, and it's a really hard discussion, people are go starting to say also, parties from the middle are starting to say we have to open up this cordon sanitaire because it will not work anymore because people that voted for them will not accept that we just have the cordon sanitaire and just it's, it's a holy principle so we just have to so we it needs but now it needs new leadership it, it will need I see that also here in your country and I'm an observer I don't I, I have no uh, I'm not saying but I the division between the party system the way it is now I don't think that will be survive that will survive the 21st century you know it needs new way of thinking because a lot of parties the green party for instance who is kind of also popular eh, in Europe uh, more and more and more and more and it's almost at the, on, at the same level of popularity as the extreme right wing but they have things that are extremely liberal that are that are what you would call socialist but also that are very conservative. So you cannot divide uh, parties anymore because people don't vote that, anymore, that way anymore and people live a different life and have different opinions than, than they had in the 20th, 20th century. So I think it will need a new party system or no party system, something else, and a new kind of leadership. Not so divisive. In, in England, it's, I think it's, it's shocking to see how extremely divisive it is. It's this or that, mm -hmm. you know? And they say uh, uh, by themselves, we are against that. And it, it goes like, it's too simple. It's, it gets more complicated. And of course, in the Brexit, that became very clear because as, as people say now, that there was a lot of already at those days fake information. You know, a lot of people voted against, uh, f uh, in, f in favor of Brexit against themselves, you mm -hmm. know, against Indeed. what was there, uh, you know, for good for them. And they discover it more and more and more by now. So that's, a, that's the other big issue in the world, that what is news? And you're a journalist, you know, from a very good newspaper, but it, things start to change, eh, that, that also lots of papers are on one side or the other. I saw this happening when I was in America in the in the weeks up to the, in the months and the weeks up to the, uh, the real election uh, in 2016. 
There was, there's Fox, which is right wing, that we knew already. But CNN, which always tended to be objective or giving the view of different parties, I saw that in the months before election, when I came back, because I was there and I went to Europe, came back, I saw it happening that right before the election, it was just a party of the Democrats, you know? And it was not a party, sure, and it became, and, it, it, and it's still like that. I don't think that's a good thing. I still believe that it must be, that we must live in a, in a world where you can get some kind of information, not only opinions. I would agree with that entirely. Uh, the tragedy of Brexit, as you rightly say, though, it, it has caused this terrible fracture and division in this country. Uh, you mentioned the press. I mean, the, the fact is, though, it's not really an even debate in this country because the majority of newspapers are very pro-Brexit and there's a few anti. Perhaps we should move on from Brexit. And <laughs> to, I mean, we could talk about that for the rest of the morning. Um, I'd like to talk about your own method of work, for a start. Um, ben Brantley, the drama critic of the New York Times, who's a great admirer of your work, described you, I think I've got the phrase also right. Also a big critic sometimes. <laughs> a maximalist minimalist. And I yeah, read somewhere that I must say that I liked. You like that? Yeah. So why did, why did you like that so much? Maximalist because it was, minimalist. It is was spot on. Uh-huh. I, I, well, and I have my interpretation of it because, you know, it's like that's the beauty of such a simple thing to say. Yes. Uh, but that means that in sometimes, listen, a, 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 a production that became very famous here, of course, is A View from the Bridge, mm -hmm. which you would call a minimalist production. But it has a maximal effect. You know, people are moved in an extreme way. I got people that came out of it say, I need now three whiskeys to calm down, yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, so it choked some people. And it was totally simple. Uh, uh, but there was a cathartic moment at the end. So that's, but I, some, for instance, Fountainhead is a maximal production. There's a lot of things happening. It's live music, there's a video, there is uh, uh, act, a lot of actors. It's, it's long, but it's four hours intermission included. So it's a no, not a normal length. So that's a maximal production. But it has also, it's done in a very, on itself, when you look at the different elements in a very minimalistic way. So I think what Ben Brantley wrote there, uh, really expresses, it, it, it brought all my different kind of productions into these two words. One fact about your work that is obvious and we must talk about is the influence of cinema. I mean, I, lucky I've just seen your production of The Damned, which played at the Barbican from the Comédie Française, and I mean, there, uh, cameras are on stage throughout and live action is being projected onto a screen uh, behind us. In All About Eve, which was in London this year, obviously cameras were integral to it. Uh, you often take your subject matter from film, don't you? The films of Visconti, the films of Ingmar Bergman. Are you trying to break down the barriers between theatre and film, in effect? Mm, yeah, it's, it's my little comp small contribution uh, to uh, open up the repertory. <laughs> because repertory is, of course, plays, but also Shakespeare, for instance, Romeo and Juliet is not, is, is, was based on a long poem, an existing long poem. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just material, that's a poem. And he made it into a drama. So he did the same, it's nothing new. And I think we should also, like novels, of course, these, these are a long time accepted, that you bring a novel on stage and that you can adapt a novel on stage, it's for a long time. And I think I'm the first, one of the first ones ever to have started with bringing uh, f films to the stage. I did it already in 96 or 7 it was, uh, with uh, my first one was Faces by John. G oh, no, my first one was The Servant. Uh, oh, Harold uh, Potter. Yes, oh, I, but yes. then I was very young. I was 24, <laughs> and I adored that movie. And I brought it to the stage. Not very successful. I should do that perhaps again once because it's yeah. a wonderful text, and it it's really th the, the thinking of Pinter in the is is all in this uh, one movie. I think you know, yes. and it's a, and Joseph Losey, a little bit a forgotten cinematographer. I don't know here, but in Europe anyway, and he made some beautiful films, and this is one of them. Still very nice to, see, to look at it. Now, I'm, but I'm you don't just uh, use film as a source of inspiration. As I said, you actually use the techniques of film, don't you, on stage? Yeah, but that has to do with my youth. Uh, when I was young, I had no money, 
and uh, uh, to go to the cinema was really cheap. And I was lucky enough to live at the corner of uh, what, what they call the cinema theater, you know? That, m that would mean that, for instance, the Visconti movies, you could see all of them, you know? Every day there was another one. Mm -hmm. And it was like, like nothing, it cost nothing. I was all, most of the time with three people alone sitting there, you know? That was, I saw, I saw, and it was the time, I'm a child of the 70s, eh? So, uh, 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 then I was a young man, I mean. So, and it is the time that the Italian cinema, the British cinema, Ken Russell, Joseph Losey, uh, name them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Italian cinema, the French cinema, also the American cinema, the young Scorsese, the young Coppola, you know, they made things at the top of, their, of, their, of what they could do. So I, I've seen all of them, and I still, when I'm directing, you know, that scenes from those movies pop, uh, it's in my hard disk. I have a hard disk somewhere, it's, it's there, you know? So I use a lot of examples also to my actors from scenes from movies. So m when I have some free time, I have no hobbies. My only hobby is going to the movies. That's really what I love. And what about I, directing a movie? I did one, but uh, in, in, in Holland. Uh, some time ago, but in Holland it's very difficult to make movies. But, no. but is it your secret passion to extend your career and direct movies? I'm now? not sure, because the difficulty with movies is that... Well, this, this one movie I made in Holland, you know, which was, the script was done, and then it took me three years to, to make it happen. You know, uh -huh. I'm a little bit restless, <laughs> you know that, yes, because I produce a lot and people think, you know, well, how is he doing that? But it's making theater and making opera, you know, <coughs> and uh, you know, making film should be part of that. It's like, I, it's, my, it's like my diary. So I cannot wait three years to do <laughs> make the next step in my diary. And uh, so it's very, that, uh, that I find difficult in the movie business. Yes. That, that uh, production times are so long, you know, even for a small movie, they're quite long. So that I find a little bit difficult. Yeah, movies devour your life and your time and your energy, I can, I can see that. Um, moving on a, again to another subject, uh, you would be seen by many, I think, as a sort of standard bearer for what we call director's theatre, where we go to see, we go to. It sounds like negative. Did, did you hear well, that? No, I'm, no I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not being negative. I just want to explore the term director's theatre, by which I mean uh, we're drawn to your productions because we know there'll be a very strong visual concept, there'll be a very strong visual idea. But the assumption with director's theatre is the the text is secondary to the vision of the director. Is, is that how you see it? Do you, do you see the director as the dominant force? No. No. I, I think uh, our little discussion about the rape scene, yeah. I read uh, exactly what uh, Ayn Rand has written and I put exactly on stage what I think she has written because, and that's, this is the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in, uh, in school, I had one, uh, I had not a, a lot of very good teachers, but one was really good and he, he was an actor and he had retired as an actor because he was bored with being an actor and he became a professor. You know, and a professor, he was teach, he has been teaching me a few lessons and one of the lessons that he said is that there is no objectivity in a text. No, no object objectivity in a text. No objectivity right. in a text. Right. So, and I can easily illustrate this. You know, uh, uh, when you say, well, I think it's, it's stupid, eh, but I love you. When there is I love you, you can say that in at least 10, 15 different ways. I love you. I love you means you don't love me, perhaps. I love you. You know, and I can go on. Mm -hmm. So there is no, uh, in these three simple words, there's no objectivity. There's not one way to do it. So that's interpretation. Every text in a theater has to be, needs an interpretation. And an interpretation is, of course, a v starts from a vision. You know, but it's not apart from the text. In my case, I, I'm really a classicist in that way. Eh? I study a text line by line by line by line with my dramaturg. You know, I study every scene. I look at the build-up, at the structure, how an, a, a character changes, where it happens, you know. So I study, I question every line, every phrase. I question it. I don't take it for granted. I try to understand it. So I'm not the kind of director, you know, that that reads a script, puts it down, and starts fantasizing about it. Not at all. Also, my scenographer, Jan Verswijfeld, who I worked with for 40 years, uh, 
Well, when, once he has read a, a play, he know, he, once he has read a play, even when we ha wouldn't have produced it, he knows exactly what it was about 20 years later. So once he has read something, it, it takes a lot of time, because I always say, Jan, hurry up, you know, <laughs> like, let's move on. He says, no, 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 I want to read. Uh, so we, we are really very much text-based, but every text needs a vision. If you just t does it, do a text the way that you think the, the author has intended it. What do we know about Shakespeare? What he intended, what his intentions were? Nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. That's the trick. A lot of times, you know, a defining production. You know, a very famous production, a streetcar named Desire, mm -hmm. the the, f the very famous Elia Kazan production. You know. That, that has become like, that's the way to do it. Stanley Kowalski has to be like Marlon Brando. I, I, I admire Marlon Brando, I admire Elia Kazan, I admire that movie, but when I read uh, Streetcar Named Desire, I read he is a Polish immigrant. That I didn't see in that movie. Mm -hmm. An immigrant, a Polish immigrant from Europe. You know, not a beefy guy, just mm -hmm. a working class man. And, you know, so that means that I can put accent on this, and, and Elia Kazan can put it on something else. Both are very fine, you know, because it was very consistent what he has done there. And I, when I did my uh, street name design, I think it was very consistent also with the text of Tennessee Williams. So that's right. two different visions with the same words. Right. I agree. I understand your point. All text is ambivalent, open Are to... Are you convinced? Well, I'm convinced <laughs> intellectually by your argument. Of course I am. Yes, I understand exactly what you're saying. But I'm just looking at your work in practice and the work I've seen over the last 10 years. And I see, I, I detect what I think is a sort of slight shift. I mean, for example, when you did View from the Bridge, it, it's a respected text by an author, you know, recently dead, Arthur Miller, etc. And you were faithful, as I recall, to every line of the text. When you did a production of Hedda Gabler, which we saw at the National Theatre, is it you were freer in your use of text? Is that not fair? No, 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 because... Well, the well I mean, it ju well, it, uh, just a, a few examples leap to mind. Judge Brack in that play, yeah. uh, in Ibsen's text, he insinuates that he is going to uh, manipulate Hedda Gabler sexually. In your production, he does it quite visually, frontally. No, you know. no, 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 but there's now a misunderstanding. Yeah. The, the text is the way it's written by Ibsen. Mm -hmm. What I say, the way I interpret it, is perhaps a little bit different than what you expect. Yeah. But it's, and that's the problem now, that, that what I'm saying, there is certain cliches about some plays, about the famous ones, the way you should do it, you know? What I do is I try to think I, I try to treat every play as if it's, it came on my desk and it was written yesterday. Right. So I'm not going to delve into what everybody else has done with it. I try to read what I, what, what's, there, what's there according to me. And that's the thing. It's always according to me. Even when you pretend to make a classical version, a so-called classical version, very near to the original, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. We don't know what Arthur Miller has been thinking. We don't, well, there we know a little bit because he has written about it a lot, mm -hmm. but not, not all authors do that, you know? Some authors give almost no indications, you know, to uh, directors indications in their text. Some give a lot of them, you know, so, but you never really know what the real intentions of an author are. You will have to discover for yourself what this text can mean today for audiences today. And that's the other thing, because, if Ibsen would have lived today, he would have perhaps written it in a li little bit a different way, or he would have done it in a little bit a different way. You ne we never know, we cannot know. But that's also what I think huge classical texts are able to do. They can talk to us in every era in a different way. Why can we play the Greek tragedy still, you know? Uh, uh, after all these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. It's because they touch a common uh, and they talked about their wars at that time, you know, it was mm -hmm. about them, you know, and still we can, we feel that they talk about us. And that's the, that's the genius of a really good text, that, it, it's, that it's like a sponge for every age that we are living in. You obviously must be aware, you, you are a very powerful director with a very strong style, and you've had an influence, it seems to me, on another generation of directors coming behind you. I mean, Robert Icke in England, uh, Simon Stone in Australia. Are you conscious of this? And they seem to be much freer with the text than you are. 
Is that, is that fair? No, but they, uh, Robert and, and Simon, who I know very well because they are also directing my own company, mm -hmm. uh, and they, uh, they write their own texts most of the time. Yes. So, like Simon is an extreme, uh, a good example in a way that he did, well, he did hear Yorma. Because that's a play that everybody, know, well, not here in London, yes. you know, which is like, he took, he took the structure of Yorma, he took the characters of Yorma, but he made it into a modern play. So, but it's, again, the same as what Shakespeare did. You know, when Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet, I take the same example, I can, to, to, to say, this, would, can tell, to say the same about other plays of him. He took a poem, you know, of somebody, and he made it into his own thing, and he invented Mercutio. That's all, that was his invention, story-wise, mm -hmm. you know, but, but he made it into a drama, and he made it into his play. That's what Simon Stone, I, I don't want to compare that, but it, 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 it's about the system, the method, eh? yeah. it's the same thing. It's nothing new. There is not so many new stories in, in the world, you know, but it's how you tell them which makes it interesting and new. Just thinking of uh, the influence you've had, I wondered what you would say, there may be a young director in this room now, I'm not sure. What would you say to a young director who came to you seeking advice about a career? Is it something you would urge them to pursue? Well, what, what directing? Would no, you it's very simple, but it's stupid cliche. Uh, be yourself, it's Howard Rock, <laughs> be yourself. <laughs> but I mean it, actually. Well, first of all, but there's not so many young people now here, but what I would advise is, and what I always say when I go to schools, because I try to talk to as much as possible to younger people, is don't hurry. You have only one life. Well, I think you have only one life. So better, before you make a decision what you want to do with your life, be sure. And it took me, when I was 17 years old, uh, of course, I wanted to do something in arts, but I wasn't really sure. But my parents, they really made me go to university. You know, it was for them, I come from a very small town, very small village, 2,000 inhabitants. So for them, arts was like, an, they, can you make money with it? You know, it's like nothing. Uh, uh, so I went to university and uh, I, went, I was there for three years. I studied law and then at a certain moment I stopped. I'm not going to tell the whole story, but I stopped. And I went to my parents, I stopped. I know exactly what I want now. I want to become a director. So, so I was at that moment 21, uh, uh, 21, so it took me, well you would say it's only three years, but when you're young, three years is like uh, an enormous amount of time, you know? But I think as a young boy, as a young girl, you have to take your time to, to, to find your mission in your life. And otherwise, if you don't do that, you will become unhappy. When you're unhappy, you become frustrated, you will be not nice for the people around you, so you, it will be a mess. And, I made the right decision and, uh, and I'm very happy and, and still every day I live with the fact that I made the right decision when I was 21. That would be my basic advice. You have to not, to, not to do what other, my parents wanted me to, of course, to be a lawyer, you know, mm -hmm. of course. I said to them, no, uh, no, I'm not going to do that. Even when I was a good student, not an extreme good, <laughs> but a good student, you know, I, I said no. For them it was not they couldn't understand it you know i went my i went my own way and i think well here i am still because i made the right choice making right choices at the right moment is crucial so and be not or, be yourself, being hurried up by people around be you. yourself and be patient you're saying yeah um there's a whole host of other questions i could ask you but i think it would be we've only got about 10 minutes left so if anyone in the audience oh there's already a question could you shout it out uh, sure yeah What drew you into adapt a little life? Yes. Yeah. Little life, yeah. Do, do people know what uh, the, the, yeah. yeah. Well, that's one of the, well, sometimes things happen in my life. It's a little bit, it's connected to the story of Ayn Rand in a way that I've, I've seen the, the novel already in, in, in all the bookshops in, uh, because it has this uh, very famous um, photo on it. So I'd seen that, but I never had bought it. I didn't care about it. I thought, well, uh, then, once I came home from a holiday, and I always, be, I always meet my dramaturg just to see how was your holiday and what's up for next year. Okay, and then he gave me, he said, I have something for you, and he gave me this book. Uh, uh, and he said, there's really something for you. Okay, I thought, oh, 700, I'm not a big reader anyway, you know, like... like you like, like long no? books, though. Yes, and it's, <laughs> they always give me things like this. Okay, so I think, well, okay, thank you so much. Uh, and then I had a meeting with uh, one, one of my actresses, uh, and 
also to catch up. And also she had a plastic bag. And she said, I have a, something, I read this, this summer something, it's really something for you. Another version of, of uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so I said, okay, thank you. So I thought, well, now I should read it. So I started to read it, and the first 80, first 80 pages, I thought, well, it's just a coming of age story of four guys going to, to New York. You know, one wants to be an, arti uh, an, uh, an artist, another one, you know, I said, we know this, you know. But then, of course, this novel dives into the abyss of one character, Jude. Uh, and you discover that he was ex in a, abused in an extreme way from his seventh, that's very young, seventh year on, until he was 15, when he was abused in and in also physically ruined his life. And so it's about this abuse, extreme abuse, and the fact that when, once you're traumatized, you will have to live this, you will have to live this every second, with this every second in your I find it still hard to, hard to talk about, I have to say. It becomes emotional always, I don't know why. Okay. But it's also a story about friendship. Of the people, I can't, it's hard. Come and see it. Come and see it. So, right. you know, I think it's one of my best productions I've ever made. We are not allowed to do it in England, in, in English-speaking countries. That's because of rights. I knew this, Hania and me, I made a deal with her myself. And she said, well, because she wants to make a television series out of it, which will happen or not happen. Uh, it was invited by the Barbican immediately after the premiere. It was invited in New York. It was invited in, 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 in Australia. We cannot go there. It's the way it is. So you have to come to Amsterdam. It's, yeah, well, it's, it's we very hard to get in. Right. You know, it's, a, it's really, it's a bestseller in the theatre. And it's one of the best things I ever did. Um, gentleman in the front row and then a lady at the back, yes. yes. Thank you, I'm interested in whether you take a different approach to your opera directing to stage, because you're very clear about your stage direction, you start with the text. Yeah. I wonder whether you start with the text and the music in the opera, I'll, or is it still text? I'll just repeat the question. Uh, the gentleman was asking, the question I wanted to ask actually, is whether your approach to opera directing is any different from your approach to directing stage plays. Well, I just did two of them. I, I just opened the production last Saturday, uh, Rise and Fall of Mahagoni, in the Ex Festival Ex Provence, and I did Don Giovanni at the Opera Garnier in Paris. Uh, I don't do it too often. Uh, uh, but that's another issue. Uh, no, in opera, there is a crucial thing. First of all, because also a lot of younger directors ask me about opera, and I say, well, you really have to be totally in love, and I really mean in love, not liking it, but in love with music, and a, having a deep interest in music. I had that all my life. Uh, but I waited for a long time to do opera. I got a lot of offers, but I did it only for the first time when I was 39, Lulu Alban Berg, which I couldn't refuse because Lulu I had done on stage. I was in love with Alban Berg's version and, and good, okay. So, but that's the first thing. You have to be in love with the music. The second thing is you have to accept that there has been a director before you. That's the composer. Because what's the difference? It has, it, it has to do with what we discussed earlier on. What the difference is, you know, the I love you from the theater, in the opera there would, there would be an indication of forte, or piano, or pianissimo, and there will be a, a, a tempo. So the I love you is limited to a few options only. Of course, in a forte you can still have different dimensions, but you can make, not make a piano out of it, because then you will be out of tune with the, with the orchestra, it will not function. You know, so the, there is a limitation. The limitations are smaller, which I love. You don't believe me, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love to have these imitation, uh, limitations and to work within them. And then I start never reading the libretto. Some, most of the time, of course, when I get an offer, I know the opera because I'm a, I, I, I was lucky in Belgium because we had in Belgium Gérard Mottier, who in the beginning of the 80s, he was one of the one, uh, first one who brought Patrice Chéreau, Peter Stein, uh, Luc Bondy, you know, all, and we saw them in Belgium as the first. You know, all these greatest directors of the theater made their first steps in the opera, you know, in Belgium, in Brussels. So I, of course, no money, but I get into dress rehearsals, you know, and, I, and so I learned really to love, 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 love opera. So a lot of operas. So, but then I always try to find out a good recording of uh, the opera. Uh, I put on my uh, headphones and I uh, uh, take the score. 
and start uh, to, to listen to it while I uh, look into the score. I've done by now, I don't know how many, 15 or 17 operas. One of them is the Ring des Nibelungen, and you know a lot about opera after that you've done that. And I know as a director, I cannot read notes, but I can read the score. And I always direct from a score, never from a libretto. And uh, I know where we are, and I know what kind of indications uh, are important for a director. Because if it is a do, re, mi, that's not the most important thing for a director. That's for a conductor important. But the tempi, the where it changes, where there is music left, you know, where you can make a move. So I, it's really it takes me a lot of preparation. It's I st it needs study, research. I need a musicologist uh, to to guide me into the score, you know. But I can say that once I start rehearsals. I know what I'm doing, also musically. Great. Um, yes, question at the back. Hi. Um, I saw uh, Kate Blanchett in Sufficiently Tortured, each other, and um, the reviews were correct. I don't know why Michael what yours was on that one, but hopefully higher than the one star that a lot of critics gave it. I personally enjoyed it. So in which production? Uh, Kate Blanchett. In the National. Sufficiently Tortured, each other. In the, the, the Martin Crimp play. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So My production, huh? No, 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 no. Katie Mitchell. She's British. Well, <laughs> no, we have to. No, we have to ask Katie Mitchell. I'm afraid the, the answer to the question. But anyway, we'll keep the question. We'll keep the question on ice. Thank you. Anyway, uh, yes, hand at the back. Did you hear that question? Yes. What do you get from the collaboration with fellow artists? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question because you know, my name is always there and my face is always there, but I will always say Ivo van Ove is a group. It's not just me, you know, and I mean it in a metaphorical way, like, of course, I, I mentioned already my scenographer, Jan Verschweifeld, you know, but my whole team, I tend to be very loyal with people. You know, last week we opened the Mahagoni, and then it was Andas who did the costumes for uh, a few from the bridge, for network, for, you know, call it, you know, we worked together for a long time. I like to work with people all over again, again and again and again. It's the same with actors. I, in Amsterdam, I have an ensemble of actors, it's uh, 15, and I have also people that are on a pension already, but they're still with with company. Uh, but the system doesn't allow that I fully employ, employ, employ them, I have to say, but I still work with us. Frida is in uh, one of the, them is in her 70s. Uh, my oldest actress was until yes, last year because she died now, uh, uh, 83, you know. So I love have, having people from 19 until 83, not like working with a group of only my age, you know. So that's important. So the actors are also important. And that's the essence of theatre, you know. The essence of theatre is if if you want to if you if you want to be a dictator as a lot of the, uh, uh, directors in the past were why not be, become a painter you know and then you make and make a painting to totally the way you want it but if you are in the theater you should have your eyes and your ears open to what all other people's all other people uh, bring to the table i'm known for for my very tough preparations you know people know that that i know when i come to the uh, rehearsal i know what I want, but what I want is I know the journey. That that means I have, I, it. We start in Amsterdam and we go to uh, uh, to Moscow. You know, I have to get them to Moscow. But going to Moscow, you can do in different ways. You can fly. That's the quickest way. You can also go by car. That will take you more time. But you see different things by then when you're flying. You can go by hitchhiking. You know that is even slower. So the way to go there, that's you, you have open, to be open to the process because people bring things to the table. But if somebody suddenly says, why not go to uh, Budapest, then I say, no, 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 no. That's, <laughs> that's for next time perhaps, you know, but not this time. We keep going to Moscow. That's our goal. And that's the thing about collaboration. That's the, that's the difficult, the most difficult moment for a director in the process is the last two weeks. Because then you go into tech rehearsal, then you go to the result. 
of things, eh? what the whole research and what the result is. And that's the moment that you have, that's the dif most difficult moment to keep your eyes and your ears open. Because then people start seeing the result and start giving comments on it. And my doors are very open. Every, all the time there's people sitting in my rehearsal room that are not working in the production, but just young people from schools, whatever, whatever. They can sit there, I don't mind, you know? And then people start saying things. That's annoying sometimes, you know? <laughs> really, you could kill somebody. That, but because he or she puts his, 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 his finger on a problem. I have learned, you know, not to react. By, I'm famous for saying no immediately, and then everybody knows he's thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm doing. And then next day, I always need a good night's sleep. And then the day afterwards, I know I'm going to follow or not, or she or she is right. I have to fix this. I have to do something about it. That's the, you, if, if you cannot allow that as a director, you will never make successful productions. You have to be open to whatever people say, however annoying it is. And even if it is the day before opening night, you have to be open. It's very difficult. So be open as a director. What, there's probably time for one last quick question. Yes, there's a hand there, yes. Yes, your, sir. Uh, are you able to tell us anything about the work that we developed in the factory? Oh, well, the factory. <laughs> oh, the great, the great no, project. No, but I can tell Mark, you know, that, that, well, it's also announced that this is like a pre thing, you know. Uh, no, Mark Ball, eh, the big boss eh, here. I'm, 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 you know, he came to me to, in Amsterdam some some time ago already to talk about the factory, which sounds like a really an amazing, ambitious, but also amazingly artistic uh, 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 challenge. You know, and you know, I like to work in bigger circumstances, like, like the armory, in, in when we did the, the damned in the armory in, in New York, it was fabulous, you know, to do it over there. Uh, so Mark invited uh, me and my company to think about a production that we could, uh, that could be produced here, and co-produced here, and produced here. So I embraced that idea, and we are talking about, I'm uh, <laughs> very political now, very <laughs> diplomatic, <laughs> but we are talking about uh, when to do that, and, and and the most important thing, what to do. Because it has, for me that's important that there's a conversation between us. You know, because I can think, oh, I want to do this, but it has also to, to be, uh, to mean something here in Manchester and within the British context. You know, I'm very, when I did, I, I would never have done the view from the bridge in my own company. It was because David Lyon from the Young Vic, he said, this would be good, you know, and I said, why? And he explained me a little bit why. So, and, and that's why we came together. You know, it's, uh, I'm always open for also for suggestions for other people. In this case, I have a little, I have an idea about what to do, and we will see, you know, if that is the right idea on the right moment. The good news then is you'll be I back will in be Manchester. back, like it or, lo uh, or hate it. You know? <laughs> I mean, the great news is you'll be back in Manchester, yeah. which, which, is, which is reassuring. It is my first time, you know, but I had, I'm here for only for one day, but it feels really like a very vibrant city and also on the move. You know, all the cranes in the, in the city, you know, like <laughs> it's like a cityscape on itself, but it gives like future. This I is think, your first you know? visit, is it? It's my no. first visit, yeah. But Shame. You, you will be back. Yes. And I want to thank you very much indeed for thank talking you. to me so okay. honestly, candidly and brilliantly. Thank you very much, Ivo. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.